if you take your tongue and put it up to the roof of your mouth so the tongue body can get all bunched up like here. Are you a buncher or are you a retroflexer? But look, I know how to zoom now. No way. And I know how to pan with elegance, with grace. And I'm going to get into my, you know, get the glasses aligned. Um, welcome. If you are just joining us on YouTube, welcome. This is a channel all about language. So if you like language, if you love language even, please do subscribe because we're always talking about things like linguistics, language learning, constructed languages, all manner of things, ancient languages as well. Um, but today we are here to talk about vowels. And if you have not seen the original vowel apocalypse, the revealing the secrets that phoneticians don't want you to know about vowels, I would suggest watching that video now and coming back to this. However, if you're alive, you don't have that option. So just sit back, relax, and I will tell you the secrets that phoneticians do want you to know about vowels. So without further ado, I will switch over with elegance, with grace, to the blackboard, which I don't know, this might be an inside joke, but it might be a little too inside, but look, I know how to zoom now. No, wait. Okay, so, yeah, there we go. And I know how to pan. Ha 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 ha. Okay, so just sort of proud of myself there. What we are going to talk about today are some some interesting things about vowels that we didn't get to talk about last time. So last time, if I can arrange my desk so that I can get to my tablet, here we go. Last time we talked about this vowel space. And we talked about the vowel space and we made it look like this. And I said something, if I recall correctly. Oh, look, that's all, that's all, you can see it. This is wonderful. Um, I said something like, this axis here represents the height of the vowel, and this axis here represents the backness of the vowel, so we have front and back vowels, we have high and low vowels, and these dimensions correspond roughly to the position of the tongue in the mouth, specifically the position of the highest point in the tongue in the mouth. So when you're making a high front vowel like E, the tongue's up high and forward in the mouth. When you're making a low back vowel like A, ah, down there, it's exactly the opposite. Your tongue's down and back. And this is to a certain extent true, but um, we have to have a, a little bit of a, uh, we have to have a little bit more of um, precision uh, because we can because it's not 100% totally true that backness and height refer exactly to the position of the tongue. Uh, what they actually refer to is something slightly different, but in order for me to explain what it is, I have to talk a little bit about acoustic phonetics. And as I am not a phonetician, um, inevitably there may be some, some lapse of the tongue, so uh, if there are any phoneticians in the room, please, or in the chat, please uh, please jump in if I'm uh, if I'm glossing over some important differences, but I, I basically want to give you uh, the, the gist of what's going on here. So, and you know, hey, you'll at least know what keywords to Google after this, right? So when we think about speech sounds, almost all, well, when we think about sounds in general, almost all sounds have sort of complex structures containing many different pitches, if it's not just a, a tuning fork. Um, so when we look at, when we talk about vowels, this sort of speech sound that um, that that we call a vowel, the pitch that the vowel is spoken at, which is which is um, made by the vibration of the vocal folds, um, we have that pitch, but we also have higher pitches, overtones, uh, that come from the shape of the vocal tract, and um, the places, the, the precise uh, peaks uh, of um, uh, the, the frequencies at which these, uh, these overtones occur are called formants. And what's really cool about these vowel formants is that you can actually hear them 
under certain circumstances. You can hear them just on their own. Um, and I, I got this, this example from um, Latifogan's textbook, uh, which is a great introduction to phonetics. Maybe we'll have to put the, uh, the link in the description for that. I am going to write that down as well so I don't forget to do it. Um, so if you whisper a vowel, what you're doing is you're, you're not vo uh, vibrating the vocal folds anymore. So if I say ah versus ah, I don't know how well that's going to come through. You can let me know. Um, you don't get the fundamental pitch of the vowel. What you get is one of these, these overtones. So I'm going to say a few words in English and notice how the pitch changes, even though I'm not make, vibrating my vocal folds at all. So the words are heed, hid, head, had, hod, hood, hood. So I'm going to go through them in that order. I'm going to whisper them and see, see if you can, uh, you can let me know uh, if, if this effect comes through on the mic. I'm going to get really close. This is ASMR time. Heed, hid, head, had, hod, hood, hood. Now, I'll do, it, I'll do it again just so that we get the full effect of it. Heed. I don't know about you, but I heard it going down. What I was doing was moving through of these vowels from front to back. And as I move through the vowels from front to back, we hear this pitch going down, 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 down. Um, so these overtones occur with peaks at different frequencies, which depend on the shape of the resonating chamber. What's the resonating chamber? Chamber, the vocal tract. And when we manipulate the shape of the vocal tract by moving around our tongue and various other articulators, uh, we change the shape and the peaks, these frequency peaks change. And so these are our formats. Um, so why am I telling you about all of this? Simply because these formats are actually the key to understanding our vowel space. So I'm going to go back to the blackboard because I've just been moving windows around. Okay, so there are three formats that are most relevant for talking about vowels, and then really only two are needed for most of them. Um, and formants, the way they're named is they go up. So as they go up in frequency, you get F1, F2, F3, and so on and so forth. Um, so each vowel has its own characteristic values for the different formants. And it turns out when, <laughs> this is the coolest thing of all, when you plot these formant values with F1, it's just under my camera, but hopefully you can still see it. F1 along the vertical axis and F2 minus F1 along the horizontal axis, you get the familiar vowel chart. So you get E up here, you get Ah, uh, down here you get ooh somewhere up here, depending on exactly how you're saying this ooh. Let's say this is kind of like general American. Um, you have schwa nice in the middle. And so this seems to be what phoneticians, before the advent of, of being able to measure um, formants, this seems to be what phoneticians were describing as height and backness. So that's really cool. Um, we still teach in intro classes this tongue height thing, but it's not totally correct because actually when, when you think about high vowels, high vowels like E, high front vowels, the tongue is actually much higher when you look, you know, say you do an ultrasound um, imaging of the tongue, the tongue is higher, much higher for E than it is for U. Uh, so as you go back, high is a lot less high. Um, so that's kind of cool. So F1, F2, and F3 are the, the frequencies at which the, um, at which the, the overtones, the peak of the overtones occur. Now, here's where I'm, <laughs> I'm a little bit out to see because I am no, by no means an acoustic phonetician or a phonetician of any uh, variety. But that is, that is my understanding. So if we want the hard, the hard math stuff, we might have to, uh, we might have to go ask, uh, ask one of them. 
And you may be curious to know why F2 minus F1 rather than just F2. And it turns out that F2 is affected by the rounding of the vowel. So it's, we get something that looks more like this chart when we, when we take the difference. So that's a little more information, a little a bit of an initiation into the world of, uh, of phonetics. And I want to move on from that to talk a little bit more about different things that you can do with vowels. So, uh, and I, I promised that I would talk to you guys about this uh, earlier. Um, things like advanced tongue root. That's something we want to talk about in semi-vowels. Um, so, basically, I want to mention, uh, yeah, four things. Uh, rhoticization, nasalization, advanced tongue root, and semi-vowels or glides. So nasalization, let's start there. Nasal vowels, and to get a sense of what those sound like, that's something like en, en, on, un, e, as opposed to a, o, u, e. Um, how are these made? They're made by lowering the velum. And if you're not familiar with the velum, you can actually find it on yourself. If you take your tongue and put it up to the roof of your mouth and find the roof of your mouth, it's hard. That's the hard palate. Keep going back until you find the soft palate, and that's the velum. Um, you can also find the velum in, in that the uvula, the little dangly bit from cartoons, right? Uh, that, that hangs down from the velum. So what the function of the velum is, is to close the passageway between the, the nose and the throat, um, or to open it. And when we lower the velum, we open up this passageway that allows air flow to go up through the nose. So we get something like, oh, we have airflow coming out of the mouth and the nose here uh, for a nasal vowel. Or for a purely oral vowel, um, raise the velum, ah, ah. You can tell that there's nothing going through the, the nose because ah, 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 ah. It sounds the same whether I plug my nose or not. Whereas a nasal vowel, you get the difference between ah, 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 uh, so hmm, it's going to make me want to sneeze. Um, so that's uh, essentially what's going on with nasalization. Now that we know a little bit about acoustic phonetics, um, we could ask what are the correlates of nasalization on a vowel? And <laughs> as far as I can tell, it's not a very simple question. Um, the effect the acoustic effects of nasalization uh, are different depending on which vowel is being nasalized. But one thing that I think is uh, important to note, and if you are a conlanger, this is, this is doubly important to note, is that nasalization acts to reduce distinctions, perceptual distinctions between vowels. So it makes essentially high vowels, so let's go back to our chart here, high vowels sound lower and low vowels, so let's say we have something like ah uh, here, sound higher. So it's essentially squishing the space, the perceptual space that these vowels can exist in. And as a result, it's harder to distinguish between nasal vowels. And as a result of that, you will, I think, never, you never like to say never, but as far as I know, never find a language with more distinctions in the nasal vowels than in the oral vowels. And you often find uh, languages with fewer distinctions in the nasal vowels uh, compared to the oral vowels. You know, think of, of French, where I think we only have four nasal vowels, but we have a lot more than four oral vowels. Um, so that's cool as well. So that's nasalization. Let's move on to rhoticization. So rhoticization, fancy word for becoming more like an R. Um, you can rhoticize vowels. What does that sound like? It's something I have in my own native uh, native variety of English. So er, er is a rhoticized schwa. Er, uh, er, uh, er, uh, er. Um, this rhoticization, it's actually really interesting. The way to produce this rhoticization, if, there are several. So... It's really cool. I want to see if I can, yeah, let me see if I can draw a little sad um, picture of a picture of what's going on. Look at that. Do I have enough space? I don't have enough space anywhere. What's wrong with me? Let's zoom. Oh, the skills. 
the technical skills. Okay, so we have, uh, what was I going to talk to you about? Yeah, rotization. So we have the, got some, some lips here, some teeth, an alveolar ridge, hard palate, the velum, the uvula, and then we have some bottom teeth, and then roughly the tongue is going to be in here. So options for rotisizing a vowel. One option is to take the tongue and pull it backwards a little bit. And so this, to sort of have the tongue in this place behind the alveolar ridge. So uh versus er. So I don't know if you can see, I don't know if you want to see, but I have my tongue tip going a little bit back behind the alveolar ridge. Er. There's another way to create this rotisization, which is that you can bunch the tongue. So the tongue body can get all bunched up like here. Maybe I'm, let's make it even bigger. Er, er. So if you speak uh, a variety of English that has this rotisized vowel, this er, you know, burger, that one, um, then you can find out which type of rhoticizer you are. Are you the type of rhoticizer that uses the tongue tip? Er, er, er. Or are you the t type of rhoticizer that uses the tongue body? Er, er, er. Notice that you probably, I don't know about you, I can't really hear the difference. And in fact, there doesn't seem to be any appreciable difference. It's just some people do it one way and some people do it the other way. And there are even in between um, realizations that can get you this rhoticization, which is really, really cool. All of these uh, have the same effect, which is to lower F3. Um, so we're, we're getting some great stuff in the chat here. Yeah, so there are peaks in the, sp in the sound spectrum and counted from as you go up. So F1 is the lowest, F2, F3, F4, and so on and so forth. So F3, when you have a rhoticized vowel, wherever F3 would be in the non-rhoticized vowel, it, it gets pushed down so it, it's at a lower frequency in a rhoticized vowel. And that happens no matter how you produce the rhoticized vowel. So that's kind of cool. Um, so any, do we have any speakers of, of um, varieties of English or other languages that have rhoticized vowels? If so, drop it in the chat or in the comments if you're watching on YouTube. Are you a buncher or are you a retroflexer? Er, do you use the tongue tip to make your R or do you bunch up the tongue body? You know, takes all kinds. Uh, I'm a buncher. I don't know. I don't know how I became a buncher. I'm a buncher. Okay. Then the next thing, and this is going to require some setup, I think, because I'm going to have to open up a, a web page and share it with you because I am not capable of making this distinction. So we're going to be talking about advanced tongue root. And I've got a whoop, spoiler, Tokipona Toki stuff coming up. Um, so I'm going to get this up here and I'm going to, I'm going to turn on the audio from the desktop. Hopefully this doesn't mess anything up. And let's see if you guys can hear this. Yeah, apparently it just wants to open. All right, well, fine. I don't know what any of this Arik. Is. Did we hear that? Did we get an Arik? All right, well, I'm going to wait for the, the time lag to catch up, and I'm going to explain a little bit about this ATR business. ATR, Advanced Tongue Root. So back to our Blackboard. We have to draw a little bit more. So the tongue actually, the tongue is this amazing muscle, and it attaches somewhere down here, and so it has different different components. It has the tip, the blade, the body, and uh, it has the the tongue root down here. And super, you heard excellent, um, and. In some languages, we have a contrast 
that occurs um, based on what the tongue root is doing. So in these languages, the tongue root can be advanced, so farther forward, pushed, pushed sort of towards the face, or, or pulled back. And essentially what that's doing is creating more or less space in the pharynx, which is this, um, the, the area of the throat behind the, the, the mouth and nose technically. Um, but in this case, we're, we're talking about the mouth portion of the pharynx. So this, this pharyngeal cavity gets larger or smaller depending on what the tongue root is doing. And in some languages, also what the larynx is doing. So, you know, I'm going to try, uh, maybe I'll, I'll put myself on full screen here so you can see and move the mic out of the way. I'm going to try and do raising and lowering of the larynx. Can you see? My singing teacher would be so proud of me. Um, so that's also lowering the larynx down here. You saw it go down there, um, is going to create more uh, space in the pharynx as well. And so let's listen to what this, this contrast sounds like, because it's a bit abstract, I think, otherwise. So I'm going to get this up here. This is a common um, phonetic feature in West African languages. So here we have... Um... So first we're going to hear, hopefully, the um, advanced tongue root version and then the non-advanced or retracted tongue root version. I don't know why it insists on doing this. I don't know what groove music is. Aok. 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 And here's the non-advanced tongue, tongue root version. Aot. 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 And we can try and hear it for, with some other vowels to... I find this a very difficult distinction to, uh, to latch on to. But here's, here's an actual minimal pair. So... Apet. 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 Versus... Apet. 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 So one thing that's interesting about this distinction is that it kind of sounds like the the tense lax distinction we have in English between things like beat and bit. Um, and in, there have been some findings that the tongue root is involved in this distinction as well. Um, so big controversy, people fight about it. Um, I think the consensus these days is, is that these are separate things. Um, but that's something that I will have to defer to the, uh, the phoneticians on. Uh, how do I get back to my... Yeah, how do I get back to my blackboard? Here we are. Okay, and let's... let's. I, I don't think I need the blackboard anymore, because I'm just going to talk about semi-vowels. So semi-vowels, this was a question we had last time, was um, semi-vowels are segments that are vowel-like, but they function as consonants within the within the syllable structure of... of um, a particular form. Uh, and they are true consonants in that they can be geminated, for example. So these are things like y, w, um, which are the consonantal versions of e and u. There are also semi-vowels corresponding to other vowels, not just e and u, although th those are by far the most common. We also have semi-vowels um, corresponding to the the rounded version of e, which is e, uh, so we have, this is a hard one, something like yeah, yeah. So it's it's like yeah, just the first part, by the way. I need to put a vowel on there so you can hear it. Uh, so imagine I'm saying yeah, but then rounding the mouth for the, the y, so yeah. Um, and then we also have the unrounded version of oo. Uh, so oo, oo. So instead of wa or we, you have le, le. Uh, and okay, yeah, I will, I will bring back the blackboard because I want to show you the IPA for these things. Um, so let's, so the IPA symbol for, let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Uh, the IPA symbol for ya is 
Nope, that's the wrong. That's a spray paint. What the? I just want to. I just want a pen. Okay, that's that's fine too. So we have yeah. Uh, for for the the consonantal version of e, we have wa for the consonantal version of u. We have this guy. Oh, no, let's let's write it straight. This guy for the uh, rounded y, y. <laughs> and this guy for the unrounded w. So uh. Um other vowels too can uh, function as as consonants, so function as can can be semi vowels, but they're so rare that they don't have their own IPA symbols. So you would just say something like Have this little diacritic to say I'm not syllabic. Okay, so I think more or less that is all I wanted to talk to you about vowels today because we have a lot of conlang to do. Um, so I will return to the full screen and thank you all for joining us for this segment. Um, if you have watched all the way through on YouTube, you must like vowels a lot, and if so, please do consider subscribing because you will encounter so many more vowels and consonants as well. So, all right. I think that's that. <laughs>